In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. So since we started Mass late, and I got here late, here in Long Island, I would like to just speak briefly about some great saints. Today, of course, is the guardian angels. The guardian angels are appointed by God over each one of us. Priests have two guardian angels, popes have probably have more. The guardian angels are very powerful and they intercede for us and they look after us and if any of us are still alive, it's usually because the guardian angels were doing their job. Normally we should be killed in a car crash, drowned, or uh, some accident. Normally that, that happens and we all have close calls, right? And usually those are the angels who are fulfilling God's will. The, there are also guardian angels over whole cities, over whole states, nations. Remember a hundred years ago it was the angel guardian of Portugal who appeared to the three children in Fatima, little Jacinta and Francisco and Lucia. So pray to your guardian angel and they're, busy, they're very busy. Remember there's billions and billions of angels. They want to help us. Uh, I'm sure many times they would like to wring our necks and paddle us, but they can only do what God permits. But they always inspire to do, to do good. They always inspire us to do good, to be better, to love God more, to do everything for His glory. So we should pray. Archbishop of Feb used to speak a lot about realizing the real world we live in with angels, with the saints, and our Blessed Mother. That is the real world, and that's part of the real world that God made. The real world is not just material things. We're not pigs, we're not monkeys. God made us for himself, and he gave us big brothers in heaven, and these are the angels. And he gave us great friends in heaven, big brothers and sisters in heaven. These are the saints who intercede for us. So you should love these, um, our friends. Who really are working to get us to heaven by their prayers, by their intercession. For example, the great Saint Anthony. How many of you pray to him when you lose something? How many of you pray to your patron saint? How many of you pray to your guardian angel? Or we just forget them, right? And they're always around. And of course, just as there's a guardian angel to help us on the path of virtue and to avoid sin, there's also God, Satan assigns his devils too. And he'll assign his devils on people to attack and constantly harass, constantly try to tear you down and lead you into sin and weaken you. So that's why it's so important to pray because we're always in war. We're always in battle. And it's, it's prayer is not just decoration like on a tree that you learn to do from mom and dad when you're little and uh, you know, oh that's just cute for little kids. No, but even the holiest old monk who's 99 years old, he better pray every day because he could still lose his soul. We all have to pray every day. So tomorrow is another great saint. Tomorrow is Saint Teresa of Rizu. There's her picture over there. Saint Teresa is she is an interesting saint because she really didn't do anything, all, she didn't fight any battles, she didn't win any victories over the Muslims, she didn't build churches, she didn't found monasteries, she was sim a simple nun who grew up in a simple family, kind of a house like this in France, and um, she had a big family, two of her sisters went into the Carmelite convent. And as a little girl, she, she really wanted to give her whole life to God. At nine years old, she discovered the power of prayer. She heard about Pranzini. He was a criminal that was being executed. And he had, been, he had many murders and whatever, robberies. So he was going to be executed. And she prayed to the heart of our Lord, please convert this soul. And she offered sacrifices for him. And a few days later, she was able to see in the newspaper at home, her father left out, and uh, there was the story of Pranzini, and she read it. 
When Branzini went to the scaffold, he be hanged. Capital punishment. But before the hanging, he turned to the priest and he said, Father, give me that crucifix. And he went to confession and he was, he was killed right after. So he most likely saved his soul. And St. Teresa, she, she saw that as a really great grace from our Lord. And our Lord was showing her the power of prayer, the power of sacrifices to save souls from hell. She really had that, ch that childlike spirit of the, of the three children of Fatima, right? The three children of Fatima, they saw hell. And there's a photograph of those children right after they saw hell. And they, they're shaken up. They're pale. They're, they've seen something so horrible. And they said we would have died if, if Our Lady didn't promise we would go to heaven. They would have died of just fright. So there's a photograph of these three children. <laughs> and they're pretty, you know, they're, it's a black and white picture. But they're certainly pale and they're pretty, certainly shaken up. Why? Because they saw a huge ocean of fire. They heard the roaring of the fire. They heard the screaming of the dam. And they're cussing, they're swearing, they're, they're, they're blasphemies against God. And screams of women, howls and groans of men. And they saw the souls being tossed like sparks of fire in a, in a fireplace. And they also, Sister Lucia makes an interesting addition. She describes the beasts of hell. The beasts of hell. That is, whatever form the devils take. Huge spiders, huge centipedes, half ape, half centipede, whatever. Just think of the ugliest in insect that, that you would not like to have around you. A snake or a rat or whatever. And, and size that by, you know, 200 times. And the devils do take on beastly forms. To frighten and torment the damned. So when the children saw hell and they understood from the Virgin Mary so many go there, they, they had, it was like a retreat for them. And when they saw the beautiful face of the Virgin Mary and her sorrow at so many souls lost, she, those three children understood what life was about. Life is about escaping the fires of hell and getting to heaven and loving our Lord so much that you help other souls get there. Those children were wise. They were wiser than many university degree students and master's degrees and who have no clue what they're even on earth for. But these three children understood. And so St. Teresa had that same spirit. That same love of souls, that same love of God. And, but she wasn't a little mouse either. She was quite bold, this little French girl. And at age 15, her father took her to Rome. So they made a pilgrimage to Rome from France. So they were on the train a long time. and They prayed rosaries. And she, she learned a lot on that trip. And they, they traveled with a priest who said mass with them. And, she realized priests are human and they need prayers. And when they went to Rome, they were able to go and have a private audience with Pope Leo XIII. And he was, he was tall, very skinny, very old. He was a good pope. He wrote powerful encyclicals, uh, condemning separation of church and state. He wrote about the, the, the need for the social kingship of Christ. He condemned all the modern errors. He was just a good pope. And uh, you should read his encyclicals. So the, uh, everybody was instructed, don't talk to the pope. You kneel down, kiss his shoe, get his blessing, and move on. Now St. Teresa, she was not disobedient, but she had a great, such a love for Christ. And she so desired to give her life to Christ at age 15 to the Carmelite convent that her love outdid the rules and when she came to the Pope she kissed his feet she stood up and said Holy Father please give me permission to go to the Carmel at age 15 <laughs> and the Pope uh, 
you know, here's this 15-year-old girl breaking all the rules. But he saw that her heart was aflame. And he said, my child, very kindly, he said, my child, if it's God's will, you will enter. And he gave her the blessing. And they also went to the Colosseum in Rome, and she snuck under the no trespassing signs and got uh, bundles of dirt, dirt that was soaked in martyrs' blood. Remember, over 11 million martyrs in the first 300 years of the church history. To be Catholic in the first 300 years basically meant you're on death row. You don't have a long life but you're going to go to heaven by martyrdom. So she gathered the dirt and held it sacred and took some home with her. She also saw and took dirt from the tomb of St. Cecilia, where the body of St. Cecilia was found in the 1600s, right? She was martyred in the early 100s, one, maybe 180, 190, or early 200s, around there. She was martyred. They, they cut her neck. And uh, she, she was buried in that catacomb. And 1,600 years later, they, the archaeologists were digging in, in the, the catacombs. I think it's of St. Calixtus. And they broke into this hollow area. And they found her body perfectly incorrupt. The blood was still fresh on her neck after 1,600 years. You know how long that is? And then she was as if sleeping. And uh, so in 200 years after that, little St. Teresa, at 15 years old, she would take some dirt from that also, as, a, as relics of where St. Cecilia's tomb was. So she went back to France, and then she, 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 her, she had a great love for her parents. Her father gave, would spend a lot of time with her talking about the things of God. And um, her father deeply put in her the love of God. And good fathers can do that. And a family reading they would do at night, uh, they would read from the liturgical year, Dom Guéranger. Huh? You all know that book? It's 15 volumes. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. And uh, he would read it out loud for the family, after the family rosary sometimes. So that's the household of St. Teresa. So at age 15, she got permission from her pastor to go, the parish priest, to go into the Carmelite convent. And she entered the Carmelite convent as a 15-year-old girl, which was very unusual. And she embraced that life. And she, she had, of course, a great love for our Lord. She, she didn't just live happily ever after. She had many crosses in the convent. She had many crosses. The grouchy nun that was always complaining and the sisters kind of, no one really wanted to be around her because she was just always complaining and the pain in the neck for everybody. But St. Teresa asked to take care of that old nun. And she took care of her like she would Christ himself. So in that way, she really practiced the true charity. And she also... Um, uh, describes how in the in the chapel during see the carnival at convent they do an hour of meditation in the morning and an hour of meditation at night. So during the meditation there was a nun right behind her always praying her rosary but driving all the sisters crazy pounding the rosary against the pews. And that sound just drove her crazy. Most people would you know turn around and frown or tell her to knock it off. But St. Teresa she just offered that up as a sacrifice to God. When they were cleaning laundry, some, one of the nuns was kind of careless next to her and splashed her with all the dirty water. This happened often. And she didn't take a towel and whip her. She just um, patiently offered that up. That was it. So she teaches us that in our daily life, we all have many crosses, we all have many sacrifices that just come upon us. And we can offer that out of love for God. And that's the secret of her sanctity, of St. Teresa. And towards the end of her life, she died at age 24 in the convent. She had uh, tuberculosis. She was coughing up blood. And uh, the pain was sometimes really great in her, her wheezing in her chest. And so, listen to this. You know, how many of us would do this? 
She was in the infirmary where other nuns were, and they were sleeping quietly. But she was coughing and coughing and coughing. So what she did, she would crawl out of the room and sleep in the hallway. Because she, cause she said, I don't want to wake up my other sisters so they can sleep. So you can see the, the charity that this great sister had. So great St. Teresa, there's a lot to say about her. Really all of you, all of you should read her autobiography. I hope you, some of you have. Uh, you really should read it. And um, you might think, oh, well, it's just a girl, you know, it's just some cute girl in a cute convent and she didn't do anything great. But she is great. She had the soul of a martyr. She had the soul of an apostle. And she even wrote, she said, Lord, I wish I could be a priest for you to offer the Mass and bring sinners to your sacred heart. I wish I could be a crusader on the battlefield fighting for the kingship of Christ and swinging the sword and putting to death the Muslims. She said, I wish I could be a missionary and to convert the pagans. And I wish I could be a doctor of the church and teach others the love of Christ. And so what really she had was a great desire to do great things for Christ the King. And you know what? Christ rewarded her as if she did all those things in heaven. And that says it in the Psalms also. God will fulfill the desires of the just. And St. Gertrude heard from our Lord also. He told her that whatever great desires you do and you thank me for that, I will reward you in heaven as if you did it. <coughs> so good St. Teresa, she desired to do great things for God and her, her burning love of God set fire to the whole church. Because once she died, Almost instantaneously throughout the world, she was known. People prayed to her. Miracles were happening. Conversions were happening. And in the convent, <clears throat> there were many miracles in the convent. And um, she said, from heaven I will, I will shower, let shower of, um, a, a shower of roses for those who pray to her and invoke her. So she said once jokingly to her sisters, I'll do more from heaven than I do on earth. And St. Teresa, there was also a nun in the, in the convent that, you know, she was, she was French. <clears throat> that kind of explains most of it. But this French nun was really annoying. She was just crabby, just really sour person, right? And not, nobody really liked to be around her. And St. Teresa, in her heart, she'd rather be with her sisters at recreation, because the nuns had twice recreation. But she made the sacrifice of not spending all the time with her sisters, <coughs> and she made that extra sacrifice of charity to spend time with the nun that everyone kind of, kind of disliked. And she made that sacrifice, and she befriended her, and talked with her, and, and spent time with her. So that after... St. Teresa died, and the Cardinal came to do the investigation for her canonization. She, this sister was interviewed, and she said, yeah, I was, I was Sister Teresa's favorite nun. <laughs> and uh, it was the one that, you know, she writes about. So, <clears throat> so great St. Teresa, she is a very powerful saint, pray to her. And um, we might say she was a good, a good tender girl, a very feminine girl, but she had the heart of a, of a martyr. She had the heart of an apostle. She had the heart of a, a manly heart, a great virtue. So this is what you have to be. This is what you children have to be if you're going to get to heaven today. If you want to be half-hearted, you're probably going to go to hell. You're probably going to have a very hard time getting to heaven if you don't love God much. But you got to pray to St. Teresa. Pray to your guardian angel. Pray to St. Francis, whose feast is coming up. Pray to St. Maurer, who is also coming up. He was one of the monks of St. Benedict at age 7. And St. Placid. And pray to these saints. Because we're here on earth to be saints. We're here on earth to get to heaven. And this is a bad world. This age is apostate. We are, 
We are in worse days and right before the flood of Noah. Right before God destroyed the whole earth by the flood. We are in those days and it's worse. It's much worse. So it's going to be very easy for any of us to go to hell today. Very easy. And to get to heaven, we have to fight. We have to pray. We have to really, we have to make war against the devil who's always attacking. The spirit of the world with his bad music and his bad literature and his bad movies and his bad videos and it's all his bad trash. And we got to fight also even in ourselves we have an enemy. The disorder of the passions. And, and we have to, with, with frequent confession, with prayer, with Holy Communion, master over so we don't become slaves of our passions. So pray, pray to the saints and ask the great Saint Teresa, a great love of God and a manly virtue. And especially now, you know, when tradition is even wavering and yielding to the modernists, and our Superior General Bishop Fillet, of course, signing on to the, the doctrinal declaration, accepting Vatican II, accepting the new Mass, accepting the new Code of Canon Law. This is really serious. This is a betrayal to the faith, a betrayal to our Founder. If you accept Vatican II or the new Mass, you're going to lose your faith. You're just going to lose your faith. If you eat poison, you're going to die. Right? And Vatican II and the New Mass are already condemned by all the previous popes who fought liberalism and modernism for 200 years. And Vatican II, I know you kids are young, and oh, it's Vatican II, it's just a bunch of paper, and it happened a long time ago. It happened 50 years ago, almost 51 years ago. But those heresies are still hitting and shaking the whole world and dragging many souls to hell. So God put you children in this age to be warriors. You've got to fight. You've got to keep the faith. You've got to resist this, this wholesale apostasy that we're swimming in. And we're only going to do that if we are close to the Mother of God and uh, humble of heart, keep frequent confession, frequent communion, keep the faith with no compromise, and really pray, really pray to God like the saints did. So enough talk. Let's get on with the sacrifice of the Mass. And your home here becomes another Bethlehem, another Mount Tabor, another Mount Calvary where Christ is really present. And His sacrifice will take place right here. And fire will come down from heaven on earth, right here on the altar. And the King of heaven and earth will give you His own precious blood to drink, like sweet wine in Holy Communion. And strengthen your soul and burn in your soul a great love of God and you got to ask that grace a great love of God it's the big grace to ask for to love God really with all your mind with all your heart with all your soul because that's really in the long run all that matters that's all that matters O Mary conceived without sin pray for us and have recourse to thee O Mary conceived without sin Pray for us and have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us and have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.